land graphs for the last six years. And part of doing the projections is looking at a lot of things like batted ball statistics to see how to better analyze the player performance. And today I wanted to talk about solving dips by deconstructing batting average on balls in play. So Voris McCracken, he was here yesterday, I'm not sure if he's up yet, but shook the baseball world in 1999 by hypothesizing that once a batted ball is put into play, the pitchers had little or no control over the results. But since then we've asked, is the pitcher's contribution actually zero or somewhat higher? Just how high and why? Well, I'll show for some types of batted balls that pitchers do have control and for others they don't. It's combining all into a single stat that has confused the issue. Now for the definitions, batting average on balls in play is all hits in play divided by all balls in play. But the question is, is this an effective model? And I'll say that BABIP is a noisy stat because it's an aggregation of several rate stats which each have their own properties. And here are some results. I ran split half correlations of uh, game day data by taking a random sample of 60, 120, and 180 batted balls from the same list of players and then split those in half based on even odd. There is one place where the pitchers do as well as the batters in controlling the outcome, and that's on balls in the air to the outfield, which is in the upper right labeled fly ball hits. In the other three, you can see that the amount of regression needed for the pitchers is much greater than that of the batters, that the correlations are much lower, but they're virtually equal for the fly ball hit rate. Now to determine these bins of batted balls, I broke down the plate appearance using a binary decision tree. And I had originally developed this for fielding analysis, but had found that dividing data in this manner allows me to have an integrated approach using the same data buckets for batting, pitching, and fielding. So first I ask, is this an intentional walk? Second, is the batter hit by the pitch? Does he bunt? If so, does the batter reach? If yes, is it a hit or an error? If no, is it a sacrifice? Does the batter make contact? If no, is it a walk or strikeout? If contacted, on the ground or in the air? If it's in the air, is it in the infield or outfield? Pop up, hit or out? Now getting into the, the areas where I'm gonna be concentrating, if the ball is in the outfield, is it over the fence? If yes, it's a home run. If no, it's still in play, and if in play, an out or a hit. If it's a hit, do you go for two? Go for two, if you made it to second, you go for three, if you made it to third, you go for four. And for example, if you're looking, say, at park factors for triples, you shouldn't be using triples divided by all balls in play. It gets very noisy because you can't get a triple until you're first standing on second base. So the opportunity for triples is doubles plus triples to get that rate stat. And then if the ball is on the ground, does it go through to reach the outfielder? If yes, again, do you go for two, three, or four? But if the ball stays in the infield, does the batter reach base? And if yes, is it a hit or an error? Now the batted ball components that determine uh, whether you're gonna have a hit are exit velocity, vertical angle, horizontal angle, spin rate, spin axis. We don't have access publicly to much of these statistics, so on, I'm gonna concentrate on the ones on the left, the exit velocity and the vertical angle. Again, here are some split half correlation results for the ground ball rate and the exit velocity. Both the batters and the pitchers regress very quickly for the ground ball rate, and the pitchers maybe even more so than the batters. And the graph on the right shows the distribution of the true talent levels after regression of the ground ball rates. And you see that the batters and the pitchers have an almost equal distribution. However, the batters are shaded slightly more toward fly ball hitters, and the pitchers are 
are shaded slightly to the ground ball side, probably indicating a preference by the major league managers on which type of players that they want. So therefore, ground balls, the pitchers and the batters are pretty much the same, and pitchers might have an advantage in control. For exit velocity, the batters at 33 balls in play, when I measured 100 and bins of 150, and I, you can see that I got the same answer uh, for almost any size of bin on the sample size. So you know, batters, um, batted ball speed, like Rob had just said, you only need about 33 balls to get a regression um, of 0.5 to stabilize, but it's 225 for the pitchers. And you see from the graph in the lower right that the spread of the true talent for the pitchers is much tighter than the batters, only about 40%. And this is the same results that I got looking at uh, 2009 hit FX data. This was data from StatCast, and uh, Mike Fast, who was then at Baseball Prospectus, had done analysis, uh, a different analysis at the same time on the StatCast, or excuse me, hit FX data, and gotten about the same result that the pitchers are only about 40% as much as the batters on controlling exit velocity. There is some skill at creating soft contact. Some pitchers do it, and we're still looking for exactly the reason why. Now, earlier I, in the, I had an article in the 2012 Hardball Times Annual that had looked at the hit FX data from 2009, and here I show on the, the previous slide, I was looking at the pitcher's control of the ground ball rate, and here by having, this is the vertical angles, by pitchers with low ground ball rates, medium, and high, to show that the ground ball rate is a proxy for the vertical angles in the air, the distribution, that the more balls that are hit below zero, the higher percentage, then the entire spectrum distribution of balls in the air shifts downward. Now, knowing this, we start looking at some of these different bins of batted balls. And here is ground balls rated by exit velocity. Now, the dark blue line is infield hits. And for very low batted ball speeds, uh, you can get an infield hit um, about 20% of the time. If you're a faster batter, you're going to make it more often. But then as it uh, gets up to about 30, it starts decreasing down to uh, about uh, 50 miles an hour. And then from 50 on, it's very flat. So that if the ball is hit on the ground at more than 50 miles an hour, you, you can't beat it out. You pretty much have to rely on the infielder to bobble the ball or deflect it to have a chance to reach base. The purple line is the probability that the ball is going to go past the infielders into the outfield for a hit. And there's about zero chance of that happening below 50 miles an hour, but then it rises steadily, although it might flatten off a little bit at the very high speeds. The yellow line is a WOBA showing the uh, effect of extra base hits and the, and the total and the combination of those two types of hits. And as noted on the bottom of the screen that you can, you can see here that the infield hits and the ground balls to the outfield have different properties. And I have found that for fielders measuring the range and the hands, which I have as infield hits plus reached on air, I'm not going to, um, I'm going to demerit the fielder for both. There's zero correlation between those skills. Uh, so I don't believe then that the infield hits should be grouped in with ground ball hits when you're doing an analysis. And, and also on the comment on the reached on air, because the difference between infield hits and reached on air is frequently in the mind of the official score, which I will show here, where from game day, I picked out four different ballparks 
and who the official scorers were over the entire 11 year range and had their career totals of infield hits that they awarded and reached on errors that they awarded and what the uh, reached on error percentage was. And these were the four fields that had sort of the widest gap, but uh, you can see, and it's a typical spread of about 10 points, that the uh, stingiest scorer will give errors on about 35% of the uh, times that a runner reaches on an infield grounder, while um, the most batter friendly will give an error only on about 25%. Now look, switching over to the balls in the air by exit velocity, again you can see that some soft hit balls have a chance of falling in and then it drops down and rises back up until we get into the 80s and flattens off a little bit, but then once you hit about 90 miles an hour, it takes off. And then you also have a chance of getting a home run once you get up into the mid 90s, past the threshold for getting it over the fence. And this is uh, not considering at the vertical angle. Now, combining this with the previous graph that you can see that the, uh, we might define a bare minimum for hard hit at 90 miles an hour. That's at which this graph starts going up and that's also at which the ground ball hits to the outfield pass average. And you might add additional thresholds at 9,500, 105, and maybe even 110 as far as you know, evaluating batters, what percentage of the batted balls were above each of these thresholds. Now I want to also make a note about when I do the balls in the air to the outfield, I do not distinguish between line drives and fly balls as classified in game day. It's too subjective. And this is an example of why never to use line drive rates as a predictor. This is an example of Great American Ballpark. There were four different stringers that worked two or more seasons, and what their line drive rates were when they were scoring the game. And you can see that year by year, the blue line was just about 45% line drives, where the yellow line was close uh, to 30%. So the, the scorer, DW, was awarding almost 50% more line drives than IT. Then everything changed in 2013 and the line drive rates greatly increased in most parks, went all over the place. And I, I believe it's systemic changes. There might be some uh, post-processing going on. Nobody's confirmed anything to me. I have talked to some stringers who have said they aren't doing anything different. They weren't aware of changes. So don't trust line drive rates. Now, looking at the balls in the air again by vertical angle, and you can see that base hits, the balls that drop on the field for a hit, uh, peak at 12 degrees and then start dropping off rather sharply. Meanwhile, the home runs peak at 28 degrees, and don't and home runs only exist between about 20 and 45. The yellow line is a WOBA showing the overall effectiveness, which up to about 15 degrees closely tracks the hit rate because there's almost no extra base hits below 15 degrees, but then it flattens off for a while because even though the hit rate, the base hit rate is dropping, uh, the number of those that are extra base hits and then also the number of home runs starts increasing. So WOBA is fairly flat out to about 35 and then it stop, starts dropping off very sharply. So then I looked at, for each of those three, the sweet spots, the range of angles that maximized the batting average on balls in play, the home runs on contact, and the WOBA. I can see that the batting, uh, the bat bip there is fairly flat for all balls, although it starts to slope down a little bit. Uh, oh, this is... Um, Again, this is ranked by pitcher ground ball percentage. I took a, a multi-year uh, weighted mean regress. So this is a true talent pitcher ground ball rate, and then they're, they're binned by the rate to show how they affect. 
so the overall hits, uh, the, the base hits by uh, all balls, do start to drop down for the extreme ground ball pitchers, but for the balls in the air, it's a pretty steady rise. It's a little bit different for the home runs because even though the ground ball pitchers distribution slides down, that sweet spot for the home runs is still fairly much in the middle it, in, in a fat part of the distribution. But again, you can see, um, so it reverses the trend that then for uh, the balls in the air, it's a, it's a little more flatter maybe than all balls. But uh, if you're looking at like XFIP, which makes the assumption that all balls in the air have the same home run rate, well, it might not be true. And actually, that's not even quite a linear line on the top right. It's a little curved. So ex the ground ball pitch, guys who get a ground ball rate above average, uh, looks like it, they do have an effect at suppressing home runs, even when isolated the balls in the air. And it looks like if you're selecting a pitcher, the best combination is a lot of ground balls, few walks, and a lot of strikeouts. Now going in again on that uh, hit rate on outfield flies, uh, I've uh, rated them by the ground ball rate of the pitcher and there is a pretty straight linear relationship that the more ground balls you get, the balls that are in the air, the, the higher chance that it is that it will be a hit. And that was because ground ball pitchers allow more short, low angle flies and they're more likely to fall in for hits in front of the outfielders. Now, let me go back to, to two slides in the top left where you see that the blue line for all balls is pretty flat, which is going back to what we knew before, that for overall batting average on balls in play, the pitchers don't have very much control, even though I've shown that for portions of it, they do. So why does it matter? Well, first now, if uh, maybe during the game, where to position your outfielders? So I took the true talent ground ball rate of the pitcher, estimated then what the hit rate would be on balls in the air to the outfield, and then looked at each outfielder and how many balls they had hit to them with each pitcher on the mound to get a weighted mean. And Andrew McCutcheon had the highest expected hit rate of any center fielder at 418. Mike Trout had the easiest fly balls. The expected hit rate was 393. And last weekend, the Pirates, whose pitchers led Major League in ground ball percentage, and McCutcheon has had, by this measure, the, the hardest to catch fly balls for three years in a row, the Pirates announced that their outfielders are going to play shallower in 2016, according to their analysis. And this can also assist in defining defensive metrics for outfielders in play-by-play -play only leagues, such as the minors, college, summer leagues, foreign, which I do a lot of work in. Uh, so then, you know, this better informs me of the difficulty of catch for the outfielders. Now, once I have paired up on the major league level, the advanced stats, this remote sensing that we get from StatCast with the cameras and the radar, to the play-by-play, -play, we can see the relationships and the correlations between the data. As I just said, I do a lot of work in the minor leagues and outside of uh, affiliated baseball, but now I can have better insight into how the play-by-play -play actually works, what it means when I'm looking at these rate stats and then I reverse engineered it and I said, okay, if I look at the results, the ground ball rate, pop-up rate, uh, home runs on contact, hit rate for balls in the air, the outfield, on the ground, et cetera, can I estimate how hard the batter's hitting the ball? And so this table shows the top 10 and the bottom 10, the how many balls in play, the RBBS is the regressed uh, batted ball speed from the StatCast data for 2015, and the EBBS is the expected, what I calculated from their um, outcomes. And 
it was pretty close. I let's see, I um, I got an R squared of 0.61, and there was 220 batters that had 200 or more balls in play, where the range was 11 miles an hour from the lowest to the highest, and 56% were within one mile an hour, and 85% were within two miles an hour. Now, for the vertical angle, I had to uh, use the HitFX data from half of 2009, but doing a similar analysis to try to see which batters are hitting the ball high in the air, based a lot on their combination of the hit rate on balls to the outfield and their home run rate. And uh, again, got a pretty accurate uh, representation. And you know, might not get stuck up on the exact numbers, but you can get a good sense of which guys hit the ball in the air, which guys are hitting the ball on the ground. And I believe that the ability to hit a ball hard is likely a fixed value that will ch might change from year to year with aging, but one that the batter probably cannot change at will to just go up and say, oh, I'm going to hit the ball harder. However, a player can choose a certain batting style which will affect his vertical angles. Now, a fast batter with little power is going to maximize his output by keeping the ball low because on the speed matters when the ball is on the ground and power does not matter when the balls are hit at the low angles. If the guy who's only hitting the ball 85 miles an hour hits a lot of high fly balls, everything's going to get caught and he's going to have a nothing batting average. But you do have um, some guys on the right hand side who have some very successful batting averages and you know have had some careers by not hitting the ball hard but by keeping them at low angles. So well, let, me, let me go back to this for a minute and a couple comments. So this is a way of classifying types of batters. And as uh, Vince Gennaro had mentioned in a panel yesterday that we can take um, the measured or estimated exit velocity and vertical angle along with spray angle and maybe a batter's speed score and this can give us expected outcomes for the batters from these predictor components that I plan on using as personalized regression values. So if I'm going to take my sample and regress it to the mean, I don't have to regress it to the league population because this other information informs me, suggests what the player should be doing in this category even without looking at the category itself. And so then I can get a regression mean which is actually closer to the expected perform or the observed performance. So there's uh, not as much shifting going on during regression. I can probably use less regression then. And uh, also by classifying types of hitters, you can uh, more easily find comparable batters that have a similar style and you can look at those, how those comparable batters have done. So in summary, uh, the bat pitchers and the batters have the same control over vertical angles, but the pitcher's control over exit velocity is only 40% that of the batters. Therefore, after a ball is on the ground, the pitcher has almost no control over the outcome. But for a ball in the air to the outfield where the result is mostly about vertical angles, the pitcher has just as much control as the batter. Don't use line drives. Ground ball hits to the outfield and infield hits have distinct properties and do not belong in the same bin. As high ground ball pitchers give up shorter flies, outfielders might do better to play shallower and this should be considered when calculating outfield defensive metrics and the batter's exit velocity along with vertical and spray angles and speed scores can be used to classify batters when evaluating and projecting performance. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, he was pointing out some 
unusual plays, ground rule double, okay, that's a ball that falls, but then at that point, it's by rule that it's a double. So um, I wasn't trying to account for absolutely everything in this particular chart, but if you dig down deeper you know, in, in the operational uh, sense, if you're coding it, yeah, you can account for those things. Yes? Okay, I think it's a question on the interaction between the batter and the pitcher on controlling the vertical angle and the batter being able maybe to change his approach. Um, I haven't looked as deeply yet at like maybe specific interactions, and I'd like to do this, say if you take uh, ground ball pitchers of a certain percentage and fly ball pitchers of a certain percentage to see what the mixture of those um, actually produce. And I think that's useful information that I haven't quite uh, gotten into in a great level yet, but I've con been considering it. Okay. Anybody else? 